Right in the opening round, there was a very auspicious clash between the young Latvian star, Alexei Shirov, and the world champion, Yari Kasparov. It wasn't just an important game because it was the first game of a big tournament for Kasparov, it's the first time he's played against Shirov, who was heading for a ranking in the top three or four in the world prior to this tournament, but who hadn't actually played Kasparov or Karpov yet. So ELO ratings are one thing, playing the very best is another. Well, he opened with the deep pawn, no great surprise there, and Kasparov played his customary King's Indian defence. But he said quite a bit about it afterwards because Shirov himself was a great King's Indian practitioner, and part of the way he gained his expertise, you see, was by studying with Gary Kasparov at Kasparov's school in Moscow. This is the sameish variation of the King's Indian defence. And the bishop is now on e3, where it naturally goes in this variation. Well, Kasparov has played a lot of different systems, formations against this. Indeed, he's greatly enriched the theory of the King's Indian defence, as he has so many other openings in recent years. He chose the move e5, which is one of the older moves. The usual reply here, still quite a common one, is d4 to d5. If you go back to the 1960s, David Bronstein introduced a remarkable idea in this position for black. Starts off with knight from f6 to h5, nothing very remarkable there, just setting up the normal advance of the pawn to f5 for black, you might think. But after queen d2, he played the disruptive, unexpected queen check. First time this happened was against uh, Boris Spassky, I think. And the point is that if white plays the pawn to knight 3 now, black plays a complex queen sacrifice, which goes as follows. Knight takes the pawn, queen to f2, pinning, but not necessarily winning, because now comes knight takes bishop, queen takes queen, knight takes another bishop, and in view of the projected fork on the c2 square, white's got to give up yet another pawn, which he usually does by playing his king to e2, and then black takes the pawn on c4. Now, the reason why I mention all this is that Kasparov himself uh, was tempted into taking the queen against Yasser Serawan of America a few years ago. And Serawan based his confidence in this queen sack for black upon a theoretical article written by a British player, Andrew Martin, in a British magazine. And even though not all the questions are answered, it did look as though, on the basis of that game and some others that have been played, this may well be a totally viable idea for black. If you count at the moment, he has two bishops and two pawns for a queen. Very, very strange scenario. Instead, Shirov just developed his king's knight to the e2 square. Kasparov responded with a flexible move c6, yet to clearly commit himself to any formation. Queen d2, knight from b8, to d7. And once again, white refrained from advancing the queen's pawn, but played the most ambitious move of castle and queen's side. Very much in Shirov's character, extremely aggressive player. We might well now see an advance of the white king's side pawns, we might see an exchange of the dark squared bishops by playing the bishop out to h6, all of it in keeping with an attack. Gary Kasparov isn't going to stand still. He sets up his own advance with his very next move. A7 to A6. And so we're set for a ding-dong middle game. White's next move is quite a sensible precaution, king to B1. Not only putting the king a little safer, but also vacating the C1 square for the possible transfer of the king's knight, which is indeed what happened. Black responded with a projected move B7 to B5. Once again, Shirov is having nothing to do with this advanced d4, d5 we so often see in the King's Indian. He drops his knight back to c1. He exchanged in the center. Of course, white took back with the bishop. And now we see the point of Kasparov's dynamic idea. He plays rook to e8. 
losing, in inverted commas, a pawn. But in order to win it, white is really going to have to give up one of his most precious pieces, the dark squared bishop. Well here, Shirov, to the great surprise of the crowd, I think, took the bait. He took the knight on f6, the point being that the d6 pawn will fall. But, Kasparov was not, not unaware of that, as you might imagine, and proceeds to demonstrate quite conclusively that black's activity is sufficient for that. He has the two bishops, he has the dark squares, and he makes these pluses work for him. Having said A, white now said B and took the d-pawn. Off came the queens. And black played the natural developing move, knight to e5. And this is, I think, really the first critical point, because for all the criticism of uh, Alexei's grabbing of the pawn, a pawn is a pawn, and he's unlikely to be actually objectively worse here. I think he could probably have attained or maintained equality by at this point just taking the pawn on b5. That can recapture either way, it doesn't really matter, say with the a pawn. And then playing the knight out to d3. In the resulting positions, we'll see black having the bishop pair, activity, dark squares, the sort of pluses we've been talking about. But he also has that extra pawn. It's a position, I think, of some sort of dynamic equality. Instead, he didn't do that. He played a more complex, challenging continuation. He played f3 to f4. Well, Kasparov did not take the pawn on c4, because after the reply, bishop takes c4, black takes back on c4, the black pawn structure has become a bit mangled. Instead, he played the far more dynamic move, knight to g4. And now we see some pressure. Knight is coming into f2. E4 pawn may fall. There is really only one consistent move here for Shirov, that is to play the further pawn advance E4 to E5. For the time being, that shuts out the dark squared bishop, but it can be uh, easily revived by black playing the pawn to F7 to F6 at some point, which is indeed, not surprisingly, what did happen. But it's very, very interesting to see how the world champion now presses ahead to seize the advantage. Knight to f2, clearly forcing white's reply. Rook to g1. Bishop to f5, check. King to a1. And now Kasparov wants to break the game open. So before playing the line opening move f6, he plays the disruptive move b5 to b4. The white knight went offside to a4, and now f7 to f6. So the position is livening up. What is white to do? Taking on f6 doesn't look very sensible because the black rook would come straight down to e1 with terrible threats. What Shirov actually did is almost certainly a questionable move. He advanced his pawn from e5 to e6. But it's worth stopping here a while and looking at the only really dynamic alternative, which is to play the pawn from g2 to g4, whereby white gives up some material, the one pawn he is ahead, to get a bit of time back. Shirov was of the opinion personally that if black now took with the bishop on g4, then white could respond by playing his bishop to g2, with an unclear, possibly even favorable for white situation. But the world champion suggested the correct move in response to this advanced g4 was for black to take it with the knight. And he then suggested a long, complex variation stemming from the natural move bishop to d3. It's something of a flight of fancy, I think. Maybe black could just take on d3 here now. Maybe he could play his knight to e3. But this is what could happen if black plays the dynamic move, pawn takes pawn, which involves, as so often in Kasparov's play, the sacrifice of material to rest or to keep the initiative. White can now take on f5, this is where the sacrifice of material comes in, I referred to black must recapture of course, and play h3. 
and retreating the knight to f6 or h6 is clearly impossible. He gets taken. So the only really dynamic move in this position for black is to take on f4, giving up a piece. White takes the knight, and then comes the move f3. If you look at the white knight on a4, you'll see one of the clues to the possible viability of this sacrifice for black, because that piece is, at the moment, right out of it. And it's hard to get it back into the thick of things quickly. Well, we can analyze this position a lot. Let's just look at one, one or two variations. If white were to play knight to d3, activating that dormant piece, bringing it into the struggle against the advanced f pawn, black has some flashy continuations like pawn takes pawn. Mm. If white doesn't take this, this phalanx of black pawns is going to win the game. Rook takes g4, and now a very spectacular move to win for black. Rook to e1, check. Knight takes e1. F2, and the pawn becomes a queen. That was if white played the move knight d3 in this position. He might also continue more dynamically with pawn takes pawn. Black keeps advancing his pride and joy. F3 to F2. The attack rook moves. Rook comes down. Only one reply. Rook comes back. Now black brings his undeveloped queen's rook into the fray. And Gasparov was not entirely clear about the consequences of this position. But this long departure with the attempt by black to keep the initiative by giving up the knight, even in the queenless middle game, had to be regarded as the critical point, the real acid test. When I go back to move 21, where Shirov didn't play it, didn't play the move g4, instead played the rather wimpish and uncharacteristic move e6. And from there on in, the game takes a character which I think is more easily followed by everyone, because it's essentially a middle game where black has, a queenless middle game, where black has the two bishops, which are always likely to be the more potent force, and there are also great difficulties for White in getting a good coordination of his pieces. So, the world champion wasted no time in taking that pawn. Cheryl took the rook. Recapture, of course. Move 23, the White King Bishop gets developed. The next move comes as naturally as any move will ever come to you. F7 to F5. Energizing the King's Bishop, the pride of the King's Indian. Knight out to b3, getting developed. And coming out with a few platitudes about the simple nature of the black advantage. Here Kasparov drops his bishop back to f7. But in fact, to realize the advantage of the two bishops in this dynamic middle game, he had to play with great precision. Knight a5 plays Shirov. Yet again, Kasparov doesn't protect an attacked unit. He prefers to play an active move, bringing his rook into the game. Rook f1. Play Shiro. This time Kasparov did move an attacked piece, to be fair to him. Play the knight back to g4. And the difficulties are getting pretty great for white now. Rook d1 played Shiro. So off came the last pair of major pieces. Rook takes rook check. Bishop recaptures. Now another precise move, knight to e3, not taking the pawn on h2, but going after the more purposeful unit on c4. The attack bishop moves out to f3, knight takes pawn. There's one quite illustrative variation here. White now took the pawn on c6. Had he taken on c4, get the following cameo, black recaptures of course. White takes on c6. And then the move bishop d4 results in complete paralysis of the white position. A very limp-looking knight indeed on a4. So to avoid that, move 30. Shirov, this is the position, took on c6. 
And the world champion finished him off with some precise strokes. A5. Back to D2. Bishop to C6. And this is a very nice move from Kasparov. Demolishes the white position. Bishop to h6. The protected king side of white now isn't actually all that well protected, as you'll see, because the knight goes into f1. Very unlikely spot to dismantle a pawn chain from, but very effective. That was the end of the game.